Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. Eugene Trufkin is a NASM and Czech Institute certified trainer and the author of Laws of Aesthetics and the Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide. He's also the owner of Trufkin Athletics, a business dedicated to helping people interested in attaining six-pack abs, traveling, eating a well-balanced diet, and pursuing an anti-sedentary lifestyle. Welcome to the show, Eugene. Yeah, thanks for having me. On. Thanks for having me on, Scott. I appreciate it a lot. Of course. Yeah, excited to have you here. And um, we were chatting a bit about how difficult it is to source um, truly high quality meat or eggs or food in general, really, um, in, in the United States. And uh, I, I know you've written about this and talked about it previously, but would love to just start with you know, your background and how you got interested in this topic um, from the beginning. Yeah, so um, basically I grew up on like an off-grid biodynamic farm in Ukraine. And for your listeners that don't know what biodynamic farming is, it's actually what most people have a mental image of when they think of farming in general. So they kind of see like a small like family unit and like a bunch of animals on the farm, a bunch of different crops on the farm, and they're kind of living in this self-sustaining ecosystem. So that's kind of like how I grew up. But when I um, when the Soviet Union collapsed and I moved to the U.S. and I basically went into the supermarket for the first time. I just thought, like, honestly, everyone farmed that way. So I didn't even think twice about it. Like, I thought, uh, you know, like, all the eggs there, all the meats, all the vegetables were grown basically the same way we grew it on that off-grid biodynamic farm in Ukraine. And for basically the longest time, I purchased kind of, like, the cheapest eggs at Costco, for example, or the cheapest beef or the cheapest vegetables, because from my perspective, they all look the same, you know, like the factory farm stuff looks exactly this, uh, looks exactly pretty similar to kind of the biodynamic or organic stuff. So I didn't, I didn't see the value in it initially, but then probably like three or four years ago, I ran into a video on YouTube titled nutrition, the dirt facts. And it was hosted by a holistic expert called named Paul Czech. And basically at that point, I came to the realization that the way food is produced in America or the way the type of food like I was purchasing at Costco was produced like way differently than kind of like how we produced it on that off-grid biodynamic farm in Ukraine. And that's pretty much where all the confusion began for me. So for example, like most people don't care too much about sourcing high quality food, but even for the people that do care, like I'm pretty sure you put a lot of value into sourcing the highest quality food for yourself it's still kind of like extremely difficult to look through all those kind of labeling schemes, all the deceptive labeling practices and actually source like high quality food, even when you do want to. So yeah. as like, as like a quick example, let's just say one of your listeners decided to kind of like improve their health and optimize their health. And they hired a registered dietitian or nutritionist to help them out. And among a myriad of things that, kind of this dietitian would suggest for your listener to do, they also told them to buy grass-fed beef, okay? And that's kind of like a pretty reasonable suggestion. Like even a lot of people in the carnivore community are always like, oh, make sure you're eating grass-fed animals, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go ahead and break down kind of what happens in the real world when like a typical person takes this piece of advice and actually goes and tries to source grass-fed beef, which seems kind of simple enough. You know what I mean? It's uh, it seems simple enough on the surface just to ask for like grass fed beef that's raised on pasture and be able to find it. But basically, how it works is like the average person will go to the supermarket. They'll go to the supermarket and they'll see gra- that grass fed label on some kind of product in there. And basically, before we go into that, let's go ahead and kind of cover what grass fed even means in regards to beef production. So first and foremost, like all all cows or cattle are grass-fed. So when you see that kind of grass-fed label, it really doesn't tell you anything out of the extraordinary. 
how it typically works in a production cycle is about 80% of a cow's or a cattle's life, all cattle, is spent on pasture, eating nothing but grass and forage. And then the remaining 20%, they're typically like 99, probably 98 plus percent of them are sent to a feedlot, finished on grain. So you can see when you see that grass-fed label, it really doesn't say too much because all cattle are grass-fed. You can't feed like a cow or a cattle grain their entire life and keep them alive. They'll, they'll completely die off of that. And then what one thing a person would say is like, oh, who cares if they're finished with grain? So first of all, like grains are not a species-specific food group for cattle. Cattle are herbivores. They're supposed to be eating like grass and other forage their entire life. And what happens is when you feed an animal a non-species specific diet full of grain, this is going to shoot their omega-6 way up in relation to omega-3. And what that is going to cause, omega-6 is basically like a pro-inflammatory micronutrient. And when you have like a tremendous of it in comparison to omega-3, it's going to cause a lot of inflammation in the person's body. So once again, this person went to the nutritionist to improve their health. The nutritionist told them to eat grass-fed beef. They went and bought this grass-fed beef. And what it really is doing, because it's kind of most likely grain finished, is it's shooting the omega-6 way up, causing inflammation in the person's body, especially if they're eating it on a consistent basis. Um, Isn't just a... Yeah, that's definitely very interesting, Eugene. Just a couple questions on that. One, um, can anyone put grass-fed on their product? Um, yeah, let's just start there. Yeah, so here's the thing with the grass-fed label. It's basically not like a rec- it's not a regulated phrase. Like basically, in order to be certified grass-fed, all you have to do is say you're grass-fed, and there are no on-site inspections of any sort. So that's first and foremost. To make it like a little bit more complicated, 90% of the grass-fed beef sold in the U.S. actually comes from overseas. It's not even produced in the U.S. Even if it says product of the USA, that really doesn't mean anything because I can import carcasses from Mexico, process them, and package them in California, for example, and still label it product of the USA. And that's like completely, completely legal and done constantly. So the problem with that is like a lot of these countries, especially if it's coming from Brazil, a lot of these countries don't even have the money to enforce like serious crime in their countries. Moreover, going go after like minor uh, irregulation practices in the agricultural industry and making sure like this farmer is really living true to the grass fed label. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. And a lot of, a lot of times, like for instance, some people would tell me like, Oh, but you know, the, the, the beef I buy at the supermarket, it says grass fed and grass finished. Well, let's go ahead and break that down because that's a really, uh, that's a really popular phrase to use as well. Basically with the grass fed and grass finished label, I as a rancher can simply like feed the cattle grass for once again, let's say like eight to 10 months, put them on grain for a few months, finish them on grass for a week and still label it grass fed and grass finished. And a lot of times, like sometimes people say like, oh, but my label says 100% grass fed. Okay, well, I could just simply put my cattle into like a feedlot and feed them grass pellets or hay, and it'll still be like 100% grass fed. So that's the kind of level of confusion that exists in just the beef industry altogether. Yeah. And I, I want to push back a little bit. I, like, I totally agree with what you're saying that there's a lot of mislabeling. It's very confusing for the consumer. Mm-hmm. And there's some virtue signaling there with, with just using the latest hip labels. You know, a few years ago, I used to laugh how on all the like chicken breasts in the grocery store, it said gluten free on it. Yeah. Which is kind of like, duh. Well, guess, um, it was always gluten free. You know? <laughs> yeah. But they just found out that that label is like, a form of marketing and makes people more likely to buy it. But um, one thing you said is the omega-6 being higher in grain-finished beef. The data I've seen is it's, it is higher and substantially higher on a uh, ratio basis, omega-3 to mm-hmm. omega-6. But if you compare that to the average person who may have some vegetable oils in their diet occasionally, you know, maybe they go to a restaurant and get 
wings or a steak. And you know, mm-hmm. sometimes that steak is cooked in a little bit of canola oil or finished in it. Yep. Or they have pork once a week or some bacon. Um, that amount of omega-6 from those foods would more than make up for the fact that they're switching from grass-finished, truly grass-finished beef to grain-finished beef. Um, from what I understand, because the 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 absolute difference in omega six between grain finished and grass finished beef is not that much um, when you compare it to whether or not people include some of these other high omega six foods in their diet. Yeah, for sure, I'll totally have to agree with you. I'm kind of referencing it in the sense that you want to find the most nutritionally dense and superior product out there. Totally agree. Not kind of totally like agree. a substitute, but yeah, yeah. I mean like. Also, low-grade chronic stress is going to increase um, inflammation in the person's body. Kind of everyone, look at the average person in America. They're working like 55 hours a week. That's going to increase a tremendous amount of inflammation in the person's body. So it's all, it's all cumulative, you know, like relationship stresses will increase inflammation. Even training too hard for too long will increase inflammation in the person's body. So, of course, it's all cumulative and it adds up. But I'm kind of talking about in the sense that I want the best nutritional profile for the meat group. And I would have to say just hands down that if the cattle are finished or even supplemented with grain during any time of their diet, you're always going to get like a slightly higher omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Like at the cattle ranch I volunteer at, for instance, uh, three or four days a week, it's called fivebarbeef.com. Very, very credible uh, ranch operation. And when he had his meat tested for the nutritional profile, it usually came down like the omega-3 to omega-6 came into like 1.7 to 2 to 1 omega-6. Wow. Where on grain-finished beef, and of course it varies from operation to operation, but you're looking definitely at more, far more omega-6 to omega-3. Yeah, to- totally with you there. Uh, I, better is always better, <laughs> as Mark Bell would say. Um, sorry I interrupted you, but you were just finishing up with beef. Um, do you want to move on to eggs as well? I know that's there's a lot of labeling there that can be quite confusing for people. Yeah. Also, uh, before we move on to uh, eggs, which we'll cover in one second, because that's actually how this journey started for me. Like I wanted to find nutritious, healthy eggs, which proved to be like almost impossible to find as well. But yeah, let's talk. Let's cover that in a second. But one thing I wanted to finish up on the beef section is. Um, basically finishing with them with grains. Not only does this kind of create like a poor micronutrient profile in the food group, in the beef, but also you have to take into consideration like what kind of grains are being used if they are being used. Because if you see, sometimes people would say like, oh, also like it says organic on the on the package. So it must be grass fed. Well, that's not true. I could actually finish the cattle on organic corn and soy or other grains and still label it like organic, for example. Organic basically means at the supermarket level, I'd have to say if you see that USDA organic stamp, really all it says is it's like factory farmed operation, but with organic grains or inputs of sorts. And they typically don't use antibiotics unless it's important they would still use antibiotics on uh, during, the, during the hatching process. And uh, But really the only difference is you still probably get a lot of decent amount of confinement the cattle are still sent to a feedlot at the end, but all that happens is they're fed corn and soy, like organic corn and soy rather. But oh, if they're wow. not fed organic corn and soy, you would have to ask yourself like, okay, what's the quality of, of the corn and soy? Because if, if it's not organic, then it's most likely definitely genetically modified corn and soy. And if it's genetically modified corn and soy, then they're growing it with a bunch of biocides. So that's making it into the nutritional profile of the grain which the cattle then ends up eating, which then makes it into the nutritional profile of the fat and organs of the cattle, then you end up eating it. So those, all those toxins bioaccumulate through the chain and kind of end up in your body. And like the average person, the average child born in America is already basically born with trace amounts of 200 different chemicals in their body. So I, I don't think you have to run like comprehensive peer-reviewed studies to understand that having all that all those chemicals kind of brewing in your body is not going to be a good thing for your health. Yeah. Makes sense. I I didn't know that about the organic labeling. That's super interesting. Yeah. Also pasture raised. Sometimes people will say like, Oh, but my, it says pasture raised on the label. Okay. Well I can raise my cattle on pasture and bring out bins full of grains. And basically they just, it's still pasture raised. I'm not lying to you, but 
it's not 100% legit grass grass fed. So a lot of times you will see pasture raised, but not a grass fed label. So you have to kind of be able to decipher that as well. Because usually what happens in those in those operations, why they do bring out those bins to begin with is, first of all, they probably have a hard time supplying the grocery store with a predictable amount of meat on a consistent basis. So they kind of like bring out, bring in these inputs, typically grains, to kind of fatten up the animals quite a bit, because then it provides a more predictable source of meat. The only problem with that is bringing those bins out is although the cattle do have a lot of grass and pasture accessible to them, they usually typically hang around these bins and they kind of eat from the bins. It's kind of like bins are basically like candy for kids where the grass is like vegetables. Obviously, the kids are going to be eating candy most of the time if you just bring them that, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So there, yeah, just for some, uh, for your listeners to kind of not fall for those because I see those a lot as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, in terms of, in terms of your question about the eggs, that could be a little bit, a little bit tough to find as well, because let's say the nutritionist said, okay, go buy like free range organic eggs, which seems reasonable again, right? Like, uh, the average person will once again, go to the grocery store they'll find this phrase free range organic eggs and then they'll buy those thinking it's providing them like a dense nutritional profile. But let's go ahead and break down just like we did with the cattle. Uh, let's go ahead and break down what free range organic eggs really mean. So first and foremost, like free range is basically what you're looking at in a free range operation is basically like 30 to 50,000 hens stuck in a single warehouse with a small little teeny concrete patio where they have access to go roam outside whenever they like. Now, when you see, you'll always see in a free range label, you'll always see access. Now that's important to understand because access doesn't mean they actually go outside. It just means they have access to the outside. So if you're a free range organic chicken farmer or chicken egg farmer, rather, you can just have like a small little cutout in a fence and you can still be considered free range. Because they have access to the outdoors, but that doesn't mean necessarily that they actually do go outdoors. So typically in these operations, what you'll see is you'll see like 40,000 hens inside and basically like 30 of them or 50 of them running around outside in that small little concrete patio at any given time of the day. Wow. One, cool, one cool article your listeners can check out is an article done by the Intrepid. And it basically documents like a it's been a while since I read it, but basically like a six to eight month investigation that, uh, that an animal rights group did called Direct Action Everywhere. And if people want to see what goes on inside of these factory farms, Direct Action Everywhere has like a bunch of content online. Mercy for Animals is good as well. I personally, I'm not a vegetarian. I'm just saying these uh, organizations are great to follow because they give you the inside scoop of what's really going on in these factory farms. And they basically did an undercover sting on a Whole Foods free range supplier. So people obviously think of Whole Foods as like the apex of food production. And basically what they found is they planted hidden cameras running 24 seven for like multiple months. I forgot eight, six to eight months. And what they found is during those six to eight months, they couldn't, they didn't see a single chicken outside. And when they took uh, soil samples of the soil, they couldn't find any fecal matter outside as well. You have to remember like a single chicken poops about six to eight pounds of poop per month. So you would think if you had like 50 of these, 50,000 of these chickens in a single warehouse, you would at least get like a few samples of fecal matter in the soil, right? If they're running outside. Yeah. But, but they, they, they didn't find anything. And that's not an exception to the rule. That's just, that is the rule. That is how the industry operates. That's like pretty much 99% of free range operations. Now, some people might not care about the welfare of the animal. They're like, well, I don't care about how the animal lives. I just care about the nutritional profile. And that's, that's fair. But one thing you should care about is the health impact that te that type of food group has on you. Because in my opinion, it's kind of like, I don't care what your goal is in life. Like your mental and physical health should always be number one. Because like, for instance, like even if you want to do, let's say something like computer programming or something like, uh, I don't even be like an actor and a podcaster. Like, how are you going to achieve any of that stuff if you're not mentally healthy or physically healthy? Like, how are you going to achieve that stuff with uh, mental depression or like severe lower back pain or joint pain? So if you don't have like that mental or physical health, 
it's always going to, it's always going to hinder, hinder you from whatever you are trying to do. So it should be a default, the foundation for whatever you're trying to do. But having said that, like one thing you want to take into consideration is when you have these type of operations where the hens aren't rotated onto fresh, fresh pasture daily, what ends up happening is because they eat so much per day, the farmer has to bring a lot of food to the animal because the animal isn't going to the food, right? Because you're not operating them or you're not rotating them on pasture. And what type of food they're typically fed is once again, the same problem we ran into with our cattle conversation is they're just supplemented heavily with grains once again. And if it's, well, in this case it is organic, but organic corn and soy. So that's not the species specific diet of a chicken. A species specific diet of a chicken is that of an omnivore. They're supposed to be eating basically a wide variety of bugs, insects, like various vegetables. Uh, they could even gain a bunch of minerals from the ground, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, they're just fed nothing but grains. So we run into basically the same exact problem we ran into with our cattle conversation. The omega-6 goes way up and the omega-3 is suppressed, okay? And when this imbalance of a ratio occurs, like the person that consumes this food on a daily basis is going to have a lot more inflammation in their body. In fact, um, are you familiar with Joel Salatin? Yeah, definitely. Um, Polyface Farms? Yeah, exactly. I think this was in 2012. Um, I could be mistaken, but basically there's this one, um, I think it was like Mother News, one organization that basically tested pasture raised, like 14 different legit pasture raised eggs that are fed more of a species specific diet and compared them to factory farmed eggs. They're fed nothing but grains. And they found that the pasture raised eggs basically had like 400% more omega-3 like 900% more beta carotene, like 300% more vitamin A. And I forgot like a couple of other micronutrients as well. It was just like far superior. So just to give you the idea of how much of a difference you're going to find in an animal that's fed a species specific diet versus a factory farmed animal, which is fed basically nothing but grains. And in this case, the free range organic, it is factory farming. People I hate when they're deceived by this label because it's basically just factory farming with organic inputs, organic grains. And that's really the only difference. Instead of feeding them conventionally farmed grains, they're just feeding them organic grains and they're still able to be certified as organic. That's really the only difference. But you still have that mismatch between the animal not being fed the species-specific diet, which is really the key to optimize the nutritional profile of that food group. Yeah. So, uh, and that, that basically goes hand in hand with uh, chicken meat too. Same exact thing, you know? Yeah, super yeah. interesting. This episode is going to be a little bit different from other carnivore cast episodes. I started this podcast to support a burgeoning community of carnivores, which I'm passionate about. And I'm humbled to speak with role models, hear people's health stories, and discuss deep carnivore topics that help thousands of people on their health journeys. Along this journey, others have started businesses to improve our carnivore community, and from time to time, you'll hear from select sponsors on the show. My hope is to help them grow and to share with you what I believe are products that will add tremendous value to you and products that I've found useful. With that in mind, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for today's show, Optimal Carnivore. A lot of people ask me about how to make liver more tasteful in how to cook it or incorporate other organ meats on carnivore. Optimal Carnivore can help you do just that with their grass-fed organ complex. It was created by carnivores for carnivores, and they start by sourcing 100% grass-fed organ meats from New Zealand, gently freeze-drying the organs and encapsulating them into convenient bovine gelatin capsules. Just six of these capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw organ meat. Um, I personally take these every single day, as does my wife. Um, even though we both eat liver and other organ meats, our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal. And this unique blend has nine different organs, including beef liver, brain, thymus, kidney, spleen, etc. And I think it's great to get a daily dose of these organs um, when you can. So it covers all your bases, whether you're at home or traveling. What's also cool is they plant a tree for every product sold, which helps the environment. So visit www 
optimalcarnivore.com slash carnivorecast and use the code carnivore10 to receive 10% off your purchase. Thanks and back to the show. And how about um, fish, like farmed fish? People, you know, go out to a restaurant and they get, you know, Alaskan salmon or Faroe Island salmon. Um, you know, it's never wild um, unless you're at some some really nice, healthy restaurant. Um, but ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it's farmed. What's what are the problems with farmed fish? Yeah, that's a great question. Really quick, I forgot to answer one thing with the poultry thing that might help your listeners as well. And that's in a lot of in a lot of these labels, you'll often see, I don't know if you've seen it yourself. Have you ever seen the phrase like vegetarian fed? Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's on that's, eggs, especially. Yeah, that's very common to see. And that's actually not a good thing to see. What what they mean by vegetarian fed is simply that it's grain fed. So you see the trickery here? Here's where it comes in. Here's where the where here's where the trickery in the marketing comes in. Like these people, they know the average American perceives a vegetarian as a healthy human being, because that's how it's marketed in a lot of these Netflix documentaries, and people eat that up all the time. But if they kind of looked in depth, they'll see that like a lot of vegetarians could be just as sick as like obese people, you know? Yeah. But they use that phrase, they throw it on there because the average consumer see that, and they'll see in their mind's eye, they're like, oh, well vegetarian humans are like very healthy. So if these chickens are vegetarians, they're going to be healthy too. Do you see where the trickery comes in? And they're not lying to you. They, they're, they're telling you the truth, like on the label, because when you see free range organic chicken and then vegetarian fed bow, they're telling you it's factory farmed and a confined operation, but they're telling you in like such a deceptive way, it twists the truth com- completely. Because first of all, if your chicken is truly free range, they would be eating bugs and insects, which then wouldn't allow them to be classified as vegetarian fed. Although it says vegetarian fed right under the free range label, right? Yeah, it's greenwashing. Yeah, do you see how it goes in a circle? So first of all, if it's vegetarian fed, that means it's confined because it's a confined factory farmed operation. Because if it wasn't a confined factory operation, if it was a pasture raised operation, They'll be roaming outside and they'll be eating insects and bugs all day. That's their first pick. If you give hens an option between eating grain, vegetables, whatever, and insects, always pick the insects, worms, and that's their go-to. Yeah, it's crazy. And also one thing I'm kind of doing, I couldn't find a supplier that does this, but uh, even pasture-raised operations do supplement with grains nonetheless, although they have more of a mixed mixed diet. So their omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is a little bit better. But if you actually found a, a supplier that uh, basically supplements with like crickets, for example, and flax seeds, you'll get omega-3 to omega-6 ratio of like two to one or one to one. Instead of like the typical, like even in a pasture-raised operation, I would still say it's probably like one to four or one to five. You know what yeah. I mean? And a factory farmed operation, like one to 20. So it's definitely not not better just to buy the cheap. You're basically, like totally polluting your body if you buy those. If you buy eggs that say cage free on it, totally avoid those. If you buy no label on the carton whatsoever, definitely, definitely, one hundred percent avoid those. Yeah. And Eugene, like, just something that's going through my mind as I think about all this is um, a lot of people do cook most of their food from home. And I think in general, it's always healthier to cook from home. But one of the things that frustrates me and, and like one of the reasons I never order eggs when I'm out at a restaurant is I know they're like the lowest possible quality eggs mm-hmm. and I'm getting almost no nutrition from them. What what foods are like least damaging <laughs> of, of all the things you could get in a restaurant? Like what would be least damaging or what foods would you err towards knowing that it's all going to be like the worst, cheapest quality um, in general? I would say if you're definitely like 100% dead set on going to the restaurant, honestly, I just stopped eating out completely. Like ever since I've done all this research for the book, I haven't eaten out in probably like a year and a half already. Although I started the research like three years ago. So just to give you an idea, because I, to answer your question, I would pick some kind of wild fish, uh, some kind of wild fish option. But the problem with that is you don't know if they're cooking it in industrial seed oils. 
Right. So once again, it's like, yeah, okay, you might select like sockeye salmon from Alaska or something like that, but then they're cooking it in all these like industrial seed oils and all those high omega sixes and whatever other chemicals they use to grow that crop with are seeping into the fish. And then you're getting that as part of the fish too, you know? Yeah. And I'll totally. say, honestly, it's really hard to find a restaurant that does, doesn't use industrial seed oils. I would honestly just say it's probably impossible. Yeah. Even you, if you ask, you ask the waiter, like, how are they going to know, you know? Yeah. And even if they cook it in olive oil, there's um, this thing in the restaurant industry. I, I forget what they call it. It's like 80-20 where they cut, cut the olive oil down to 20% and, and just add more canola oil to it. Yeah, like at home, I just cook everything in the oven. I don't use any oils, period. That's just me. Yeah. That way you avoid all the problems with having to know like what temperature to cook it at, like how legit the oil is, how old the oil is. It's just like too much going on for me. So I just personally like avoid oils altogether. And I just use basically the oven for everything. Or if I do cook things on the skillet, I just use water. Like a lot of people don't know, but you could easily just do that. Yeah, that's a good way to go. And how about, um, can we talk about the differences between farmed and wild fish? Yeah. So, okay. Yes. You did mention that before. Um, yes, basically with farmed fish, uh, there are a couple of different like aquaculture type, um, type setups. So some of them you have on land, some of them you have on shore and some of them you have deep out at sea, but the problems are all the same. You have like a lot of confinement and they're not fed a species specific diet. The ones again, typically relied on, uh, rely on uh, grains and sometimes also like a mixture of other smaller fish that's made into like pellet form. But the problem with that is they have to use preservatives to preserve that type of those type of pellets. And typically what they use is like anthoxicine, which is a chemical made by Monsanto. And, um, there's a really good documentary that covers this. It's called Norwegian fish, the most toxic fish in the world. And it basically goes over uh, kind of how intoxicating made it into the fish pellets, then it makes it into the fish and farmed a tremendous amount of uh, tremendous amount of this kind of preservative in their flesh. And more like we talked about with the chicken, with the beef, you eat an animal, a non-species specific diet that's not natural to that animal. The omega-6 goes once again way up. So you have like once again a tremendous amount of inflammation that's being produced when you eat that food. So on top of that, you have the tremendous amount of confinement. They're going to be obviously feeding a lot of antibiotics to these fish. That's going to be making it into the nutritional profile of the fish. They spray pesticides directly onto the fish also. So that's going to be making it into the nutritional profile of the fish. Uh, basically, it's safe to say like if a person sees like Atlantic salmon or tilapia, or you have to be really careful with shrimp, like probably like 99.9% .9 of those foods are farmed, farmed, uh, raised. Yeah. And how about the, the wild labeling? Can you trust that? Or how do you feel about that? You know, that actually, that's a good question. Um, I only buy species of fish that can't be farm raised. So for instance, like sockeye salmon has like, um, a very distinct red color to it and also a very distinct taste to it. So in that case, it's like, um, I forgot which categories of fish aren't actually just totally kind of spaced on my mind, but which categories of fish aren't farm raised. You could just look for those categories and then yeah. basically you'll be fine because businesses don't exist to, to raise those type of fish on the farm. Yeah, I know. So that would include basically if you, the, the troubled categories are definitely like salmon, tilapia, and shrimp. Yeah, I know sardines, it, it, they're almost... All the ones I've seen, it's it's very common for them to be labeled wild caught. Yeah. And what, Eugene, I'm curious, what's your personal diet look like and maybe like a day of eating for you? Yeah, so it's it's very straightforward, actually. Like I get my beef uh, from the cattle ranch I hear. It's like 20 minutes from my house. So I work there maybe like three or four days a month. Um, and then I get, uh, my beef organs from them as well, obviously. Then I buy, I honestly, like I get my fish from, uh, vitalchoice.com or I just get it from whole foods, but I always get the wild caught option. So a typical day for me would be like, um, I would mix it up, heavy consumption of 
basically beef, sockeye salmon, and sardines. Uh, so today I had um, grass-fed chuck roast. I have about a pound of that. And then uh, half of a beef kidney. And probably two cups of white rice, organic. Uh, two cups of kind of steamed vegetables of a variety of sorts. A few pieces of fruit. And then like a gallon of water. So I keep it very simple. I don't take any supplements either. And I don't think if you, in my opinion... Actually, I know for a fact, if you really source high quality food, if you really source like high quality, legit pasture raised meats, eat the organs, eat the meat. If you like, I have a garden in my backyard. So literally I pick the vegetables from the garden and eat it like that day or within like a few minutes. That way the nutritional profile of that crop is going to be extremely high because a lot of people don't know, but like a lot of the vegetables in the supermarket are weeks old. And just like with the flesh of an animal, I mean, the longer, the longer it is from picking it at the root to you actually eating it, the lower the nutritional profile is. And then compared to, uh, then you have to compare that to also that is picked before it's ripened. That's another problem too. So the nutritional profile is already lowered quite a bit. Then it sits at the grocery store probably like a week or so before you pick it up. Then it sits at your house for like a few days. By the time you eat it, it's like empty calories. And also like another thing a lot of people don't know is the, the farm raised or yeah, the farm raised crops these days are kind of a far cry from like the nutritional profile you'll get from wild crops, you know, like a single, for instance, purple, to, purple, um, carrot has the, um, anthocyanins has like 900% more anthocyanins than like an orange carrot. So you would have to eat like nine orange carrots basically to get the anthocyanin content of like a single purple carrot. There are a lot of things that go into that too, depending on farming practices, the age of the crop, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the general idea. You know, like if you fr freshly pick a carrot, a purple carrot from a legit biodynamic operation and eat it on the spot, its nutritional profile is going to be through the roof compared to what you're going to find at the supermarket. You might have to eat like 17 supermarket orange carrots to get the nutritional profile of that one biodynamic carrot you're picking from the ground and eating it on the spot. Wow. And Eugene, what are your thoughts on uh, a carnivore diet or a meat-heavy diet in general? It sounds like you eat a lot of meat, um, but you talk about species-appropriate diets for other animals. So I'm curious what you think about uh, a pure carnivore diet or, or a diet that relies heavily on meat. Yeah. So honestly, I'm not an expert of this topic. You would be. You would be the expert in this case. Um, I'm kind of like, like I guess, like a carnivore-ish diet where it is pretty heavy on the meat, but then like, although I don't have that many, um, vegetables, I do have like a decent amount of, uh, I guess, grains like via white rice mainly. And, um, I do have like a lot of fruit as well. So I don't, I, I don't know what to say. My only experience with the carnivore diet is in Ukraine. Like when probably two months out of the year we would be mostly eating meat, uh, because it's literally frozen everywhere and you can't grow anything anyways. So it would be mainly relying on meat and then some potatoes. So that's my only kind of experience with being on like a carnivore ish diet. I wouldn't even say it's like a 100% carnivore diet because we still have the potatoes from time to time, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm not dogmatic about it at all. I think um, meats and, and animal foods in general are very high in nutrients and have the most bioavailable nutrients. Um, like if you think about vitamin A, the, the form in say liver is much more bioavailable than in spinach. Um, or if you mm -hmm. think about, um, you know, getting any type of vitamin B from animal foods versus plant foods or vitamin K. Um, so I think, you know, for the vast majority of people eating a mostly meat diet and getting most of your nutrition met from meat is, is excellent. And then if you want to supplement with, vegetables as long as you tolerate them or fruits um, or having some rice like you are for, for performance. Um, if you tolerate those foods and it works for you, like that's fantastic. Um, that's kind of my general thoughts on the matter. Yeah. So um, yeah, I would agree with you. I, at the end of the day, I always tell people like, you just try it. And if you feel better long-term on it, just, just do that. You have your answers. You don't yeah. need like a million and five peer reviewed 
studies that take like 200 years and you'll be dead by the time they conclude, they find their like, exactly. actual yeah. conclusion, you know? Totally. And then science is always kind of like wishy-washy too. They're always kind of like, depending on the technology, the assessments kind of improve. So then the hypothesis changes again. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, even, so the, even the methodologies in, in science and studies have evolved so much just in the last few decades that uh, like a lot of science from uh, a few decades ago can kind of be thrown out. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I think, I think it's tough for people these days because they're so far disconnected from like what being health conscious even is, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. like for example, like any, you, your listeners can even take me up on this. You can probably go walk like literally anywhere in America and like nine out of 10 people you run into are full of like obesity and disease, like full of mental and physical pain and are at least on like two or three different prescription medications. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's sad. Yeah, so with this type of individual, it's going to be tough for you to tell them like, oh, well, it makes you feel better than just do that because they kind of lost their connection to what feeling good even is. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great point. And so many people aren't even conscious of what they're eating. Like they're not following any diet or any type of nutrition plan and they're not even aware of you know, basic facts of nutrition. So I think even by examining your own diet, you're already in like the 1%. <laughs> Yeah. And then also that 1%, like I mentioned, could still find it confusing these like labeling deception claims and everything. So then you add in and you can kind of see like, dude, this is why like Americans aren't getting better, you know? And yeah. They're getting like sicker and sicker like year after year. And um, I don't know, the whole entire, I think medical is kind of like a scam for the most part outside of the emergency surgeons and all those guys. I respect those guys a lot. But um I'm like, man, you can solve like literally 99% of your problems by like simply just, I know it sounds cheesy, but it's true by simply just like eating a well-sourced diet, like sleeping well, keeping low grade uh, or chronic low grade stress under control, like surrounding yourself with loving people. And that's the secret to health right there, you know, and then living out your core values is another big one as well. Because if there's that disconnect, that's going to create a lot of chronic inflammation in your body too, because it creates a lot of stress because you're kind of like, no, you're one type of person inside, but then on the, uh, in the real world, you're kind of living this other kind of personality or whatever your job requires. And then you kind of grow disgruntled to the work then you're there all day. You grow disgruntled to your employees and this causes a lot of stress and stress is obviously the number one destroyer of your health, et cetera, et cetera. So I know that's a little bit off topic, but I think it kind of flows well into what we we're talking about. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's super relevant and definitely agree with you. I think people, uh, especially in like the whole biohacking and like health optimization space can underplay the importance of general stress, mindfulness, relationships, all of that goes a really long way. Um, and there are a lot of people who um, almost are able to shelter themselves from disease and eat a pretty crappy diet, but they have like great relationships, great family, mm -hmm. community, and um, it can almost make up for some of those factors sometimes, which is really interesting. Yeah, I really do think if you're like very on point with living out your core values, meaning like being exactly like who you want to be in the world and being true to that, I think that's the best thing you can do for your health, even more superior than like obviously everything helps, but more superior than like an organic diet and all that stuff. Because I go to like a lot of like holistic and fitness conventions and whatever. And you hear some people, they're like, oh, I eat these like blueberries imported from like the highlands of like Norway. And even a single person has seen this blueberry until like I touch it, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and then like you look at the person, they look like a cancer survivor, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, uh, just to show you kind of like, it's not all about organic food there. It has to be like approached like holistically. Sure. Obviously, in my opinion, I think organic food does like legit organic food, not like the type of free range organic nonsense that we just talked about earlier does give you uh, health promoting properties, can make your skin look better, can improve a lot of behavioral disorders in kids and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And Eugene, shifting topics a little bit, um, what are your current exercise-related goals and, and how do you approach training? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I keep it pretty simple for the most part. Like right now, I'm just into fitness. I'm looking to get back into mountain climbing pretty soon. I actually ran into your podcast by um, 
I think you interviewed a guy named Neil Fisher or Fisher Neil. I forgot exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's how, that's how yeah. I ran into your podcast because my girlfriend and I are actually planning on moving semi off grid, like mix, mid next year to the end of next year. So I kind of been looking around in terms of like how to source like wild meats. Cause in my opinion, they're always going to be superior even to the best pasture raised meats, uh, and wild fish, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of ran into that, ran into that interview. I thought that was a really cool interview. Um, oh, interesting. So yes, to answer your question, basically right now it's pretty much like a weightlifting, like bodybuilding top type diet or not diet, uh, workout routine rather. So I work out right. about four days a week, four to five days a week. But one of the days I kind of hit like a weak muscle group, like just my calves that day or something like that, that I'm looking to kind of catch up visually to the rest of my body. And then the other days is pretty simple. You know, I keep to the core lifts like, um, deadlifts, squats, uh, Etc. It's nothing. It's nothing elaborate. It's just very consistent, and that's kind of what was what has worked well for me. I'm also big into using the steam room. I try to go to the steam room like once or twice a week. I think that's great for detoxifying the body and also making your skin look great. Uh, that's does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a very holistic approach, and you've got things kind of dialed in um, on, on both the exercise and the nutrition front. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Um, well, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Eugene. Um, I, I will, uh, share any links you have at www.carnivorecast.com and also in the show notes. Um, but please let people know where they can find you and find out more about you. Yeah. And also before I do that, I do want to provide some solutions for your listeners on how to easily find, uh, good pasture raised meat. Oh yeah, so, please. That's a great, that's a great way to end. Yeah. So one is, uh, check out this website called eatwild.com. Very, very good website. You can go to the top left and on the top left tab, it'll say like meat, eggs, and dairy. Click on that. It'll show you a map of the U S click on the state you're from. It'll show you exactly where all the pasture raised operations are near your house. Then you just select which one you find suits your needs best. Contact them, ask a few questions, you know, like some questions you want to ask for the poultry are, um, do you, uh, chickens, do you rotate your chickens onto fresh pasture daily? If they say yes, that's great. How, many, how much square space is there per hen? If it's like 100 or above, that's, that's great. If it's 200, that's really good. Uh, if you do supplement with feed, like what do you use, you know? Um, if they'll say like, oh, I use like organic grains. It's like, okay, do you get the organic grains locally? Okay, that's great. If they don't, it's a little bit tricky because a lot of the organic grain, a lot of the grains in the U, like 50% of the grains in the U.S. actually come from overseas and from super corrupt places like Turkey and Ukraine. And there's a lot of corruption at the broker level. And this is very well documented. I think the Washington Post did a really good story on him. Uh, your, your audience can kind of Google that and find it. And what happens is, a conventional farmer in Ukraine would just grow the grains with a lot of chemicals. And at the broker level, so at the seaport, someone would just change around the paperwork, change around a few things, and all of a sudden it's imported as organic grains and sold as organic grains. So that's, that's one thing to worry about. Obviously, there's corruption in the U.S. too. Like there's one soy farmer that basically sold like, I don't know, like 15% of the total soy sold in the U.S., and then they found that he was actually forging the papers too and just growing it conventionally and selling it as organic. So it happens in the U.S. too, no doubt. But I, in my opinion, from my experience, it's far, far less. Um, if you can find like a chicken farmer that just supplements with like crickets and flax seeds, that would be like super awesome. Maybe then they could tell me where they found that person because I can't I can find anyone that does that. Um, Another thing is like some states require certain vaccines to be used. So ask what kind of vaccines they're using, if they are using them. Um, usually if they sell across state lines, then they would have to use vaccines. If they sell locally, then they don't have to use vaccines, uh, at least with cattle. I don't know how it is with poultry, but uh, it's probably the same. And those are just like some of the questions they could ask. But eatwild.com is a great resource. If they do want to stick to the supermarket level, there's a website called cornucopia.net, I think, or .com. And um, that website is great for eggs because it lists like all of the eggs you'll find at the supermarket. And then it gives you a rating on how, how like factory farmed out those eggs are. 
And then probably for grass-fed meats, the most credible place to find them is a website called AmericanGrassFedAssociation.com. And um, that was founded by Carrie Balcom. I had a chance to interview her uh, for the book as well. Uh, that's honestly like a very credible, at least there's on-site inspections. Like I mentioned with the grass-fed label, anyone can say anything. They could just say I'm grass-fed and that's it. There's no on-site inspection. If they're certified through American Grass-Fed Association, there are on-site inspections and they can do a random on-site inspections without notice at any time as well. Uh, and they require like 100% pasture raised, like 100% grass fed as well. So those are, those are great resources. Obviously, I don't want to upsell my book, but then my book as well lists as well, lists a bunch of resources as well. And then it comes with a bunch of video content to help a person understand how difficult it's become to source high quality food and make it not so difficult. Yeah. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, well, thanks again for your time today, Eugene. Really appreciate it. Um, and I think folks will find a lot of value from from this discussion as they're thinking about trying to get the highest quality um, nutrition for themselves, whether it's on a carnivore diet or otherwise. Cool. And the book is uh, Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide. And they can kind yep. of find it. Or, or Walmart store as well. Great. Thanks cool. again for your time. Thanks, Scott. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. You can also email me at info at carnivorecast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.